9 verses 1 and 2. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. This evening, let's be together in the house of the Lord. Let us fill our hearts with gladness. Let us fill our hearts with thanksgiving. Let us rise to praise God. Let us rise to praise Him. Hymn number 87. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Let us arise and sing this hymn.
instead of having to sound 61, this evening's responsibility.
God of all creation. God who gave us life not only in the physical realm but also the promise of eternal life in and through the Son Jesus Christ, our provider, our protector, and our redeemer. This evening we bow down before thee in adoration, in praise, and in thanksgiving. Father, we are here today all because of your grace and mercy. We want to thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ to open the door of salvation that we sinners condemned because of sin may proceed through through faith, grace and mercy of God. We want to thank thee, O Father, that we have found Jesus Christ. We have found the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We have found the one who can make our life fulfilling the one who is the reason for our living, Lord. And we thank you, God, that we can come week after week in this manner to worship you. Thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your Holy Word. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the Holy Church. Thank you, Lord, for your providence that we should live our lives in the way that you have called us to be, that you have provided all the means that is necessary for it, Lord. And Father, as we come before thee, we want to acknowledge that we are not worthy, that we are sinners, Lord, that in our thoughts, in our minds, now actions, Lord, knowingly and unknowingly, we have transgressed your laws. We have brought shame and hurt to your name, Lord. Forgive us as a congregation we ask. Sanctify us, Lord, that we may taste your goodness, that we may, we may walk with you, that we may, Lord, realize your lordship over our lives, Lord. Oh God. Grant us obedient hearts. Grant us receptive hearts. Yes, Lord, to your holy word. For scripture says, Men shall not leave by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of God. Lord, may we desire your word above everything. May we, O Lord, desire to obey you above everything else, Lord, in this life. For as scripture says, Everything on this earth will pass away. Only your word, Lord, will stand firm. And may we, Lord, on the day of reckoning, on the day of your coming, Lord, be found faithful to your word, Lord, and to your work. We want to thank you for everyone who's gathered this evening, Lord, from young and old, students and workers, lay people and full time workers. Lord, we have the one God one faith and one Lord. And may we persevere, persevere as one body in Christ that we may do the good work of the Lord, that we may share the love of Christ, that we may point others to Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for bringing your people as each and every one of them. You know their needs, you know the challenges, you know, the fears, the tears, the worries, the anxiety. Oh Lord, God of all comfort and grace, I pray that you fill their hearts with peace, Lord. Peace, not like what the world knows, but a peace that comes from above, that passes all understanding, Lord. I pray help all those who still have exams to do this coming week, give them special grace and wisdom to do well. All those who have done well in the exams, we want to praise your holy name. We pray that they may enjoy a good holiday that shall come. Bless all those who have returned to work tomorrow, Lord. I pray that they may go in the strength of the Lord to do the work that is before them, to be found 
faithful stewards of your manifold blessings that you have shown upon their life. And for those who are not well, O oh Lord, I pray that the sovereign healing hand be upon them will touch them, Lord, and take away the discomfort, Lord, that is making them well, and restore them to power, that they may be able to fulfill the responsibilities that are before them. And I pray for those people, Lord, who are waiting for your direction, for your answer in their lives, may be cut to their future, their work, or their uh, marriage. Father, I pray that you will guide and govern their lives through your holy word. Father, I want to pray that this evening, thank you for bringing Dr. Gilbert in our midst. Thank you for the faithful work that your servant has, both in churches and in the seminary, for the blessing and his family, O Lord. And even today, Lord, may you speak to us through your servant, your words that teach us as faith and duty speak to us, Lord. Thank you for the offering your people have given, Lord. May you bless it and use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. We pray and commit ourselves to the willing hands in Jesus' name we pray. Ready? Let's decide the first. 
Proverbs 16, verse 32. He is so to anger and is better than one. Our friend Jesus means everything to us, and in times of sorrow, in times of difficulty, is our comfort, in trouble, is our stay. And unlike many of the friends we have, Jesus is a faithful friend. We can count on him. We can count on his faithfulness to be with us to the very end. Let us sing this song with the hope, the assurance that we have Jesus in our lives. I have found a friend in Jesus. It's everything to me.
It is still part of the overall theme of suffering. And so, if you will, um, since it's been read, I want to read it again. But uh, here, uh, notice that uh, if you are right, we know who he is. He, he's an apostle. He's one of the original 12. And yet he calls himself a fellow elder as he dresses the other elders here. And so tonight, we're really focusing on spiritual leadership for those who have authority within the body of Christ, within the church. Now, even though text explicitly talks about elders as a particular office and function, let me go ahead and, and um, understand that because the principles he's going to bring out are broad enough, they can also be applied to other positions of leadership besides strictly elders. So whether you're an elder or a deacon or a pastor or some other uh, position uh, of influence, uh, decision making, uh, having some sense of authority, this is certainly applicable to you. So I want to generalize it to being a spiritual leader rather than simply being a, an elder within the church. Now there's two things that it brings out here in verse 1 where he talks about, uh, says, I am a fellow elder along with you, and notice uh, he said, one, a witness of Christ's suffering, but also two, share the glory to be revealed. So he brings out two characteristics that describes himself, and in some ways it would describe any spiritual leader. One is a witness of Christ's suffering, and then two, one who could expect recognition at some future day, most likely the judge we see the Christ when we all have to give an account for how we fulfill our stewardship in this life, in our ministry and service, and how we took advantage of, or not, of various opportunities to advance his cause and to honor his name. Um, so the first thing we'll look at is Peter starkly being a witness of Christ's suffering. Yeah, he, was, he was there um, at the cross, even though it was from, from some distance. And we think, okay, if this is scripture and it's supposed to speak to me today, I wasn't at the cross. I didn't see Jesus suffer. But let me uh, hasten to add that we are part of the body of Christ. And so as the body of Christ, the church, as we struggle, uh, as we face various challenges living in a broken, fallen world, there's that suffering that is an extension of and continuation of Christ's suffering. When you go to the four Gospels, you find that the, the major source of Jesus' suffering, at least at a human level, was the religious leadership, who simply refused to acknowledge him in terms of his claims of being the Son of God, of being the Messiah, the promise of uh, the embodiment of the hopes of all Israel. And so they refused to acknowledge that. Uh, they had no trouble understanding what he was teaching and preaching. That wasn't the problem. The problem was they couldn't accept the fact that he had the authority, for example, to, to forgive sins. That he claiming being the Son of God would make him equal with God the Father. They couldn't accept that. And so they persecuted Jesus continually. And as you read the Gospels, it would escalate. Where it would culminate and climax at the cross. And so taking that as what it, we, uh, what uh, Peter or the, any of the uh, writers in the New Testament would be referring to the sufferings of Christ is first, first that persecution. So there, we go back and look at the early parts of Peter and realize this is what Christians have been called to do. To follow, in, for example, in chapter 3, we're called to follow in the footsteps of an example of Jesus, where through no fault of our own, and because we maintain a level of moral purity, uh, of the high road of being marked by righteousness, we're blameless, we're, we're guiltless. And so we're not at fault, we're not being punished for something that's, uh, where we're guilty of some wrongdoing. But because we're doing right, we're being persecuted. And what God is saying through Peter is that that, that earns you credit, uh, as if God is maintaining some kind of heavenly legend and saying, okay, here, here are some uh, gold stars I give you for every time you suffer for righteousness' sake. Because if you suffer because of something that you did wrong, then again, yeah, you deserve it. That, that's justice. But when you suffer, but you're innocent, that's not justice. That's being uh, unfair. But it's still to your credit because you are showcasing 
some aspect of Christ being part of the body of Christ. So that's where I think Peter is coming from, uh, given those, those passages. And let me just, uh, to remind us, uh, I just cite some verses, uh, we won't read it, but just for, for your reference. For example, he talks about suffering in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He raises that topic again in chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. Yet again in chapter 3, in verses 14 to 17, and again in chapter 4, so every chapter so far, in verses 12 to 14, and also in verse 16. So there, let me do take a little time, we read chapter 4, uh, 12 to 14. Dear friends, do, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal. Notice how Peter calls it, it's a fiery ordeal uh, that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. So there it is, that's the expression, sufferings of Christ. Not only that we witness, but we participate in the sufferings of Christ. So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed when he returns again. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. The spirit glory of God uh, rests on you. And so let me uh, pause there. Now, what we just read is very counterintuitive. It doesn't, on the human level, if you think things through, it doesn't make sense. And that's why the, the world collectively scratches uh, its head and says, oh, this is foolishness. I mean, why would anyone be rejoicing uh, when they're in pain, when they're suffering? And that's because they don't realize there's a, uh, a truth, what I would call a kingdom truth, that is part of the characteristic of being a member of God's kingdom, a member of the church, a member of the believing community, where uh, we recognize greatness through humility. Uh, where instead of being served, we're served. Where instead of uh, being the one who is uh, probably exalted, we, we humble ourselves so that Christ is exalted. We, for example, prioritize the needs of others ahead of our own needs. So all this is counterintuitive. <clears throat> and so it, it certainly runs at variance to the world, the way the world thinks. And this is what he's alluding to here as part of the sufferings of Christ, even for, for persecution. That is a blessing. And again, uh, we don't try to explain to the world. There's no way they can understand it. The hope is that we value it and so it's a matter of attitude, we have the right attitude, that we should be thankful and not be uh, resentful or angry with God because bad things happen in our lives. So in the context of uh, Peter, it's about persecution. Now in Singapore, you know, I mean the Religious Harmony Act, uh, we don't have overt persecution, maybe on occasion, but we still, there's still pressure uh, where we are to, as Christians, to uh, make the right decisions, the right choices, uh, being morally upright. And that is its own challenge and burden that we need to maintain. It's a pressure that's always on us to, um, not just from the public, but also in private, to be consistent. We need men and women to protect you as we pursue Christ's uh, likeness again. Uh, but then you hear about the sisters elsewhere who are facing overt They know as soon as they graduate from SBC and you turn back, they will face it. And yet, this is what they are sitting here for the beautiful years in preparation for. To be equipped to not only minister effectively, but also to bear the, the cross for Christ in their own country. And they are willing to embrace it willingly, and not resentful. Uh, they are not idealistic, they're, they're very realistic. Uh, they experienced it before coming here, and they'll experience it when they return. So uh, they're, they're not certainly foolhardy, they're not uh, in any, any way being deceived or living in fantasy. But what drives them is this sense of leading or prompting, or what we might call calling, to uh, bear the, the cross and to uh, face suffering, as, both as a witness and as a participant in Christ's suffering. So one thing we want to understand is well, why? Why does God allow these things to happen to us? For that, let me quote from an author 
by the name of James Packer in his book, Your Father Loves You. Here he explains the relationship between suffering and hardship and struggles in Christian life and the benefits of the truths. Okay, grace is God drawing sinner closer to him. How? Not by shielding us from assault by flesh or the devil, not by protecting us from burdensome and frustrating circumstances, not by exposing us to all the these to overwhelm us with a sense of our own inadequacy and drive us to cling to Him more closely, and the ultimate reason why God fills our life with trouble and perplexities is that we may endure, or, or so we ensure that we learn to hold to Him fast. And so, what He's saying here is that. Particularly in Singapore, it's a very merit-based kind of society. I mean, you're part of the fourth or fourth of the world. You get recognition if you work hard enough, if you're smart enough, if you make the right decisions and do this and that. And so it simply sets you up for pride, for self-sufficiency, for a sense of uh, personal accomplishment. And yeah, that may be uh, what drives and makes this you know, a first world society in the midst of uh, uh, other societies in surrounding countries that are lagging behind. But at the same time, we need to recognize that <coughs> even though we are in Singapore uh, and we are Singaporeans, uh, yet we're not just Singaporeans, we're Christians. We're Christian first, living in Singapore. And we need to realize that when difficulties come, when there's trouble and struggle, pain and the inconvenience and the other things in life. The simple things. Uh, even as a Christian, that kind of thing is there is a rhyme and reason for it. That is because God in his infinite wisdom sees the necessity for us to live this uh, very um, rough and perfect uh, life uh, here, even though it's a, a life of prosperity, if there's still a life of challenge. The reason is that we don't get too full of ourselves. We don't get too smug and too overly confident and trusting in our own capacity to get ourselves out of every uh, uh, tight situation. Here. But to overwhelm us to make us realize that we can't on our own do it, that we need help. And hopefully it prompts us to turn to Him, to our Lord, and that we will find that He is sufficient, that He is faithful. And it's to develop our, our uh, ability to trust in Him and to not be intimidated or to be overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. But to, even though we may not see our way out of it, but to hang tough, to persevere, and to trust that somehow or another, at some point in our lives, we will see the light of day. And maybe God will give us some answer to some of the questions we may ask for why this or that. And so that's what uh, James Packard has brought out, and I think this is what First Peter is bringing out here, is that life for a Christian, uh, look at what characterizes it. Uh, there is suffering, there's the burden of carrying his name, there's the pressure of uh, maintaining our, our walk, our integrity, of not going with the flow or the crowd, being counterintuitive of these things. And so this is part of experiencing and being a witness of Christ's suffering. To say that we uh, march to the to a different tune, to a different beat. And what is different about us would be an invitation to people in the world to come look at us a little more carefully. And when they do, hopefully they will see Christ. That's the whole intent of that, is we live by faith. So that's sort of one qualification for a spiritual leader. Someone who has experienced life and ministry and experienced the challenges of life and persevered to a he or she and trust in God and has been victorious. The faith is written as the song goes. This leads us to the second part of what he emphasizes, and that is as spiritual leaders, we are shepherds, we're under shepherds of God's flock or sheep. And here we come to verses uh, 2. And three again since it's been read, um, well, uh, we read it again. But notice um, as we look at this idea of responsibility of stewardship, that uh, 
I want to read another quote. This time is from a former president of the U.S., Dwight Eisenhower. Uh, he was president back in the 1950s. I look around the room, I'm not sure if anyone has been around back then. I was, but I was very, very small. Um, and uh, he was uh, a two-term president. This is what he wrote. Uh, now, understand who he, who he was. Yeah, he was not only the leader of the country at present, but during World War II, he was also a commanding general. So he was a, he's an expert in leadership. That's what he has to say about that, about being a leader. To be a leader, a person must have followers. To have followers, a person must have the people's confidence. Hence, the supreme quality of a leader is integrity. Without it, no real success is possible. Whether on the football pitch, or in the army, or in the office, if a person's associates find him a phony, a fake, that he lacks integrity, he will fail. That is his leadership. His teaching and actions must square with each other. So the first great need for any leader is integrity and high purpose. So let me re-emphasize that. So according to a former president, for uh, he was obviously talking about in a non-Christian setting, but some principles are universal, whether it be out there in the uh, sports world or the corporate world or the political arena, is also true within the church. And that is the person who is going to be the leader, if he's going to engender a follower, uh, a following, he ha it's about his credentials, his character. Is he someone that people would trust, have confidence in? So when he says, come follow me, they will, because they trust in him because he's a person of, of integrity. Whatever he says, he means it. He's sincere, he's transparent. He has no alternative um, uh, motive. He's not characterized by hypocrisy. He says what he means, and he means what he says. And his actions uh, and his decisions are consistent with what he says. So he's uh, both inside and outside. And so he's a person of, of high purpose. And so we're talking about the context of a church. There's no higher purpose than the cause of Christ. And to further the further the mission of the church. And the mission of the church, of course, is to be light and salt upon the Sermon on the Mount. And to be that, we're talking about not just individually we're light and salt, but corporately as a community, that we are together to be light and salt. In fact, that is the most powerful witness in the world. Now people, I mentioned this before, but people above the faith can debate with us about theology, saying that their theology is superior to the Christian theology. And we go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you know, they are very intelligent, certainly very logical in some of their, their thinking, and it's very difficult, and in some cases it's seemingly impossible to out-argue in the wind argument. And it's just kind of a fighting head. But what they cannot argue against, what they cannot deny, what they cannot dispute, is if we stand together, unified, shoulder to shoulder, living harmoniously, loving one another, God, excelling in loving one another, and being in the world, being a loving presence, a loving those who are in society, are making a difference, and contributing to within society where people see that we are a value asset rather than a liability then that's certainly no one can, can argue against. But then for the church to march in unison, you need a few select people who are leaders in the church to rally the troops to move forward. And so this is why the emphasis is on that. Now, he mentions a series of things to avoid for those who are going to be spiritual leaders. The first thing to, for spiritual leaders to avoid is don't serve because you're forced to serve. You know, you're getting into it, kicking and screaming. But to serve because you are willing. You know, there's nothing worse than doing something because you have to do it. And so you feel coerced, you're intimidated, you're pushed into a corner, and you're caught, caught between a rock and a hard place. And uh, so you guys seem to feel like you have no, no choice. That certainly is a recipe for, for disaster because it's a recipe for you to cultivate within your heart seeds of resentment, of, of anger, a feeling that uh, you're being uh, forced to do something you really don't want to do. And so I want to point out the difference between duty and responsibility. 
The responsibility is where a person feels that he or she is responsible for the end result. That uh, he or she has a personal stake in things. In other words, it takes ownership. And so you want the effective spiritual leader in the church to see it as this is not because I have to do this, but because I want to do this. This is my church. These are my people. I care about the church. I care about the people in the church. And so I'll do whatever it takes to be a blessing to them, to help them in their road toward the path of sanctification, of growing more and more like Christ, both individually and as a church. And so uh, as a matter of attitude, I see this as a personal responsibility rather than duty. Duty has more to do with I have to do something because I'm commanded or instructed to do so. So it's that have to do attitude and human nature being what it is, we would naturally be very resistant. No one wants to be told what to do. Some more example. Uh, I don't know if any of you, but I do not like cleaning up the home. That's just a necessity. And usually it's mean says, clean up the room. So she can't do it. No, she's not my mother, she's my wife, but you know, that's, you know sometimes you the, the line kind of blurs a little bit. Um, we, call, we call the days when I was growing up and mom and dad you know, clean up your room kind of thing. And so um, there's this natural resistance. Of course, as a teenager, you're not going to resist anyone anyway, uh, to uh, adult authority. And so you, you do it, but you don't really want to do it. And there are times I can think of excuses. Mom! Um, I'll get to it, uh, but right now I'm really, really busy. You know, I have an exam, I have homework. Uh, I'm not feeling so well. I'm busy with this and that, and, and what have you. So, you know, you keep putting up uh, for, to another day, and another day never comes. Uh, but suppose your best friend is going to come visit you and spend a little time with you, and you realize that your best friend is going to come to your room. And so, realizing that, and you want to maintain your best friend respect and to think that you're cool, so you voluntarily and you eagerly clean up your home to put it in as best shape as possible because you want to impress your, your best friend and you want to maintain your coolness. I mean, there's nothing cool about being a very, very messy room. When your friend tripped over things and you know, what have you, you know, he mentioned your dirty laundry clothes, but you know, who would want to sit on your bed with all the you know, Dirty stuff there. So it's a big difference between duty and responsibility. And so the fact of spiritual leader is one who would willingly do it because he or she wants to. The second thing uh, Peter brings out in verses 2 and 3 is uh, don't serve as a leader out of greed for, for personal gain, as if uh, there's an advantage, there's an economic or some personal advantage uh, of serving. But we need to serve, not for perfect gain, but for the good of uh, the flock, for the good of the church, for the cause of Christ. So again, Peter's talking about having the right attitude. But if we're serving in order to get something out of it for personal profit, whether it be for recognition or for uh, promotion potential or for some, something, I would say it's the wrong motive. And so when things get rough, but in ministry, let us face it, it's one of the toughest things in life to be involved in. When you work with people who are oftentimes not very cooperative, you want to mobilize them, but it's very hard to move them. Uh, it can lead to a lot of frustration. And if you're in it for a personal profit, you're going to realize very, very soon it doesn't work your time and effort because you're serving in the church, you're not getting anything out of it, you're not seeing any results or progress. But if you don't get to use your ego to serve, not for personal gain, but for the benefit of others, then you're much more resilient, you're much more resourceful, you're much more stronger and persevering and, and, and enduring when things aren't going so well, because it's not about yourself, it's about uh, others. So you're not as easily discouraged or being disappointed. You tend to persevere a lot more. And so it's important to bear that in mind. Again, it's an attitude of why do you want to serve? Not so that you can uh, be recognized, even though that may come, for the sake of Christ. Then he brings out a third area, 
in, the, uh, in these verses, in verses 2 and 3, where he said, don't order over uh, others. In other words, don't be bossy, don't be pushy, don't use it as a way to, to get the upper hand on people, to get them to do what you want them to do. So you can feel good or something. But the emphasis he makes here is that leaders have to be examples for a flock, examples for brothers and sisters uh, in Christ. And so um, what this is uh, they're saying is that one of the uh, most important uh, areas of responsibility for, for a leader, regardless of what position you hold or what kind of you have, is that we do attain a level of visibility. People do notice us and they do watch us. And our challenge is to be exemplary and to be able uh, to be above reproach, to be above criticism, so that we can show them you know, what it is to be like Christ, what it is to, to read the scripture, to obey the scriptures, what it is to, uh, to do outreach, and to, to live a life that is uh, holy and where we, we uh, live by faith and not by sight. And so being an example it, it can be very potentially very powerful. Let me illustrate this. Um, there was this coastal town. The town was situated just on the, the coast bordering the sea. And so it had a spare share of fishermen who would bring in their catch of the day onto the shore and where they would clean out the fish before it was sunk the market. And obviously when you clean the fish the insides, you know, the, the, the stuff that you reach out, they need to get rid of it. Well, a whole lot, the, the, that coast town happened to be also a place where the pelicans, the seabirds, would, would congregate and that make them their, their home during their, their migratory path there. And here was a, a symbiotic kind of relationship where the, uh, the fishermen had to get rid of the refuse from the fish. And they should throw it to the bird, the pelicans. And for the pelicans, it was a free meal. And for them, it was uh, great. They didn't have to work for it, so it was right there. So it wasn't long before they became a fat and happy. And um, it was a, a, a nightly situation for the birds. But there came a time when the industry uh, saw the economic value of the, what was being thrown out the inside of the, of the fish, or they decided to reclaim it. So no longer did the fishermen throw these things to the birds but they, they recycled it for, for other purposes there. And so the pockets were caught in the dilemma. And no more free food. And they had gotten, after a long period of time, how to go foraging for food on their own. They forgot how to fish. And so they began to starve and grow thin. And in fact, quite a few of the, uh, the pelicans starved to death. And the town people thought, you know, this is part of our dead her heritage, part of what makes us unique and special. We need to save the clock and go, what can we do? You know, we can't train them, we can't talk to them. You know, what would... And so someone came up with a proposal for a solution. I and mean, here's what they decided to do. They brought in new politics from, from outside to mean with the starving ones that have been uh, part of the town for, for many, many, many years. And the new politics were not spoiled. And so when the new pelicans were faced with the same situation, they immediately went foraging for food, went fishing. And in the process, the starving pelicans caught on and did what the new pelicans did, and that saved the day. So those who are starving finally relearned how to find food on its own. And that little story illustrates the power of being an example. And so, you know, we can, you know, Pastor David and I, we can preach and we can teach and do all sorts of things. And we can be as clear as possible. But what gets you all um, over the hill, over the hump, is if we live out what we preach and teach. If you can catch, you know, faith is more caught than taught. And that's true for faith, hope, and love. When you see your spiritual leaders living a life that demonstrates faith, hope, and love, you see the various challenges and intricacies of life that they are going through and how they manage to navigate through it, how they handle it, how they handle the pressure, how they handle the, the sufferings and cause for, for the cause of Christ, then you begin to catch on. And 
apply it to your particular situation, just like those birds in, in that story. And so that's why it's so, um, so critical that a leader, even if he took all kind of the gifts of leadership, if he is an exemplary example, he's, he has gone, he's done a major service to the church, simply being that, a role model. Which leads us to uh, finally to verse 4, where Peter alludes to the hope of future reward. There we talk about spiritual leaders. When we do our jobs, when we are faithful to our stewardship, when we have been fruitful and effective as spiritual leaders, and have done this service to be a blessing uh, to the church, God will recognize that someday. And we will then, according to him, uh, Peter, we will receive a crown of glory. Now, we don't know what that is. Is that a little crown that we place on our head? Or not more a metaphor, a figure of speech, we're referring to some kind of eternal reward. And I, since we don't have any frame of reference, at the very least, let's just say it's something that's good. Something that uh, had this in store for us who have been faithful to our stewardship. So for those of you who have any responsibility in this church, you are a leader in your sphere of influence, however small or however large. And so these verses apply to you. And, and again, just to summarize, it's a matter of having the right attitude, of putting others ahead of yourself, the needs of the church, and seeing it as a responsibility rather than as a duty or a burden. And knowing that at some point we all need to give an account of how we have served faithfully or not before the Lord one of these days. And when we have been found faithful, done our, our duty as his servants well, then we would have this positive accommodation. And this spurs not to be faithful. So let, let us pray, shall we? Lord, we're faithful to your uh, word and for the admonition to stay true that we are witnesses of the sufferings of Christ, both through uh, our service and the service and witness of the church. At the same time, we're supposed to shepherd the flock certainly by having the right attitude of uh, not doing it out of compulsion or being forced to, but only uh, willing, willing to be an example for the flock, of not doing for personal gain, but out of eagerness that uh, we will always ask, how will this or that honor on you, uh, for our Lord? And that we can look forward to someday, whatever this crown of glory may be, is ours to claim. And most importantly, that we would have you say, well done, good and faithful servant. This is our prayer, and this is our, our aim for all of us. In your name we pray.